So we'll continue today with the book of Job. And again, you know, for the sake of understanding that complex book a bit easier, uh, we have last Sabbath we just covered uh, the first section of the book. That will be chapter 1 and 2. And then there is the middle section of the book, uh, chapters 4 through 37. And then the third section I would leave for the next Sabbath anyway. But it is very interesting that uh, we look at this uh, section that people say it's inserted chapters 4 to, through 37 because in the first three chapters we see of the book of job we see the eternal interacting with job and then between chapters 38 to, to 42 we see god interacting with job again but in the middle which is this middle section of job we're introduced to a really very interesting situation brethren because god is working with job almost book ends this middle piece of the book. One of the challenging things about the middle piece is that we often spend a lot of time trying to understand the specifics of how the Eternal is working in Job's life by reading and pondering chapters 4 through 37. But in actuality, the Eternal has virtually, if you notice there in that section, the Eternal has virtually no interaction with the Job and his friends in these chapters. So let's take a different approach to bring some key thoughts and ideas out of this middle section. We don't have a lot of time of course to deal with these 33 chapters in great depth you know because again I'm a bit apprehensive to preach about Job. Job was always a very complex subject as far as I'm concerned. Nevertheless somebody has got to do it and we cannot avoid because something seems difficult or something seems um, you know uh, hard to understand. We should not be enjoy. Uh, we should not be avoiding that part of the scripture anyway. But you know, for some great depth, we can perhaps we can leave leave it for some other time. But I would like like to discuss two themes that uh, I think might bring these chapters to life to all of you at least a little bit. Those two th themes. The first is that men often. And we have been always warned, ever since I was part of the Church of God, there was always this warning, do not think that if somebody is going through a trial, that it might be a punishment for sin. So the first theme is that man often equates trials with sin and punishment. So when we see individuals enduring trials, one of the first things that is often you know, on our mind is, oh, what they did wrong, you know. And obviously there is a sin, yes, and there is punishment. I certainly agree with that. And we know that there are consequences for sin, no question about it. But brethren, proud trials and suffering do not always equate with punishment for sin, as people usually tend to think. The second theme is, we have seen that in even in the chapters, uh, in these chapters we see, I think we have already seen it, is the underlying... Uh, Underlying the discussion of Job's friends, the second theme is the thought that God is at times a demanding and harsh God, you know. Now, it's interesting how much this theme actually comes up when we are looking for it, how Job's friends view God. If you go to Job chapter 8, verse 1, please let's turn there. And as we consider the first theme, uh, let's first consider that Job's friends had some time to really consider their responses to Job, you know. Their comments and perspectives were reasoned and considered, not just, you know, of the cuff remarks, you know. Because they probably had a, at least a few days to prepare as they traveled from where they lived to where Job was. And then they sat with him, you know, for seven days and for seven nights before they started talking while they mourned with him. So these individuals had some time to think about and uh, they uh, and to craft their responses and their discussion with Job. As Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, sat with him, they were looking at a man who had been so afflicted and was in tremendous, in a tremendous amount of despair. And it is natural reflection to want to understand why this bad thing had happened to him. It's part of, you might say, the human condition. To want to understand suffering, especially when there was an expectation, as we see with these men, that God was involved in Job's life. Now what is interesting to consider is that, what issue did they actually jump to? What question is swirling around in their mind when they start to talk to Job? 
And the question that comes out through their comments is, what did Job do to deserve all this punishment? It is as though, brethren, Job had to have some terrible, deep-seated sin. And from their perspective, as they were looking at Job, Job had done something wrong, and as a result, he was being punished. Now, have we ever done that? Have we asked that question about others? Have we fallen into that trap? Well, obviously, there is punishment for sin, but I know. But that is often our first response when we see someone going through trials. And again, as like I told you, ever since I was in the church, and I was called into the Worldwide Church of God at the end of 1991, ever since I, 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 I became a member of the church, I was baptized on 10th of March 1992, ever since I became a member, it, there was always this caution that we would hear from ministry, or even from the lay members, as the lay members would discuss biblical topics, and uh, my Aunt Matilda was a very hospitable woman, so every usually after the Sabbath, the, her house would be filled with guests from the church and her various friends, and uh, she will actually made sure that she would invite people with children because, you know, because others kind of av avoided those people. Why would they invite some with children? Because children make noise and all that stuff. And, you know, English people are kind of a little bit picky when it comes to their peace and, 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 and noise. But anyway... Our house, her house, my, my, my aunt's house was always full of children, full of adults. And I would hear, you know, I would be, I was uh, a participant of their discussions and stuff. So one of the discussions was about Job. You know, what a horrible things Job went through. And uh, But I remember there was this caution all the time. Let us not think that it was a terrible sin that really, you know, uh, that was deep-seated and being hidden somewhere in Job's life. So now God is punishing him for it. And there was this caution, let us not think that anybody else who might have a trial might be having that as a result of uh, punishment for sins. So, um, obviously, there is punishment for sin, but that is often, again, our first response when we see someone going through trials. Now, please, let's look closely at how Job's friends viewed him. You would be, I think you'll be shocked. Look at Job, chapter 8, verse 1. Job chapter 8 verse 1. Then Bildad the Suhite answered and said, How long will you speak these things, and the words of your mouth be like a strong wind? Does God subvert judgment? Or does the Almighty pervert justice? If your sons have sinned against him, he has cast them away for their transgression. And these are the first four verses in chapter 8. So then, you know, here we get an indication of Bildad's view of what has gone on. He knew that Job had a relationship with the Eternal. If these calamities had been allowed, from his perspective, sin had to be involved and God was punishing the sin. Now, this same thought process doesn't just apply to his sons. He has the same view of Job as well, because Bildad continues in verse 5. If you earnestly seek God and make your supplication to the Almighty, now look at verse 6. If, verse 6, and here Bildad makes an interesting statement, and that statement has a lot of depth. If you were pure and upright... If you were pure and upright, brethren, let us consider what Bildad is actually saying here. Basically, he directly disagrees with the Eternal's assessment of Job. Because in the first chapter of the book of Job, the Eternal referred to Job not just once, but twice, as being upright. And here Bildad questions his uprightness. What is more interesting is that Bildad uses the exact same term for upright that etern the Eternal used. But Bildad's perspective was that Job's troubles stemmed from his sins, which is just the opposite of what the Eternal had said about Job. So Bildad 
is laying out his own thought process about what Job's troubles were. He wasn't trying to understand what the Eternal was doing. He was, he built that was laying his own perspective over it. Verse 6, surely now he would awake for you and prosper your rightful dwelling place, says verse 6. But brethren, as we can see, Job didn't do anything wrong. Remember, God considered Job righteous. He considered Job as an upright man. He was not self-righteous. He did not have some great or horrendous sin that he was hiding in his closet for which the Eternal had to punish him. And so, you know, we all sin. And there is no doubt that Job did sin. But there was not some massive problematic sin that Job needed to deal with. I would rather, I would like to refer us back to the, to the first two chapters of Job. It is important that we ground ourselves in the Eternal's view of Job. Have you considered that Job's way of life, his uprightness, was confirmed, brethren, in the mouths of three witnesses and four if you consider Job's wife as a witness? Now the three, the three are the individual who wrote the book, the book of Job, that was most likely Moses. And in that book, that individual stated that Job was upright. Then the Eternal stated that Job was righteous and uh, even Satan confirmed that assessment and then Job's wife. So, you might say that in the mouths of three witnesses, Job was, was cons confirmed to be upright. Not even Satan disagreed with that assessment, brethren, but the carnal mind, and at times a weak spiritual mind, will equate trials and suffering with sin and punishment. That is exactly what Bildad was doing here. And much, if not the most of the time, that equation is not accurate. Now in this case, Bildad's assessment had very little to do with God and with what God was teaching Job of how he was working with Job. Now the second thing that I mentioned is very similar to something that I think we discussed earlier. That is the thought that God is a harsh and at time mean and demanding God. Now this is not something that is new. It has been around for thousands of years indeed. This is also a perspective that we can see in our own thought process. You know, the ideas of this world, brethren, do impact the way we read the Bible, the way we understand things. It is frequently used to really scrutinize our thoughts, processes, and our beliefs because of that. Now, it's interesting, however, that Job's friends even have this thought process, and that shades what we see in chapter 4 through the chapter 37. Well, let's see. Let's consider the book of Job, chapter 11. Let's consider Zophar's comments in the book of Job, chapter 11, and in verse 5. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against you, that he would show you the secrets of wisdom, for they would double your prudence. Know therefore that God exacts from you less than your inquiry deserves. That was Job chapter 11, verse 5 and verse 6. So, you see, we come now to 
we now come to this comment and let's consider it for a second it's given to an individual who was sitting in an ash heap scrapping his source given that Zophar was purportedly a close friend of Job he probably understood that Job had a close relationship with the Eternal to add to the emphasis here and to give more insight into Zophar's frame of mind please consider something that Job said in chapter 29 verse 1 through 4 now these verses are important to help us understand Job's frame of reference as he was going through these trials Job chapter 29 and the verse 1 verse 1 Job 29 verse 1 let me just see if where is that scripture here uh -huh. it's escaped somehow from the the, the quotes has escaped but um, anyway so we go back to Zophar's comments in chapter 11 verse 5 and 6 even though the Zophar evidently understood the relationship or at least had an idea of the relationship that Job had with the Eternal Zophar assumed and evidently desired that the Eternal would speak against Job brethren you know because when you look at it what he said and let's I think I've traced it out finally yes here it is chapter 29 uh, we need to see what Job actually wanted and desired in the midst of his trials so uh, in chapter 11 verse 5 Zophar says but oh that God would speak and open his lips against you that he would show you the secrets of wisdom for they would double your prudence know therefore that God exacts from you less than your inquiry deserves <laughs> so think about this comment for a second brother given to an individual who was sitting in an ash heap scraping his source given that Zophar was purport purportedly a close friend of Job he probably understood that Job had a close relationship with the eternal now to add to the emphasis here and to give more insight into Zophar's frame of mind please consider something that Job himself said in chapter 29 verse 1 these are important things to help us you know, understand Job's frame of reference as he was going through these trials Job 21 verse Job 29 verse 1 Job further continued his discourse and said all that I were as in most is as in months past as in the days when God watched over me when his lamp shone upon my head and when by his sight I walked through darkness just as I was in the days of my prime when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent so you see even in uh, the midst of his trials after he had lost absolutely everything and now was sitting in the middle of uh, ash pile with boils covering his body well consider better what was Job's was what Job's desire actually was and uh, what that said about how he viewed his relationship to the eternal the statement by Job is very strong when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent now in English perhaps it loses its intensity you know what Job was actually saying was that he longed for the time when the eternal came to, into his tent sat on the couch got close to job and they had intimate conversations when they told each other about their deepest most innermost thoughts when they had discussions that were close and intimate well that's what job was you know that's what job missed that's what his desire was for even though in the midst of his various trials and uh, when we think about it you know what would you what would you or I desire if we were in Job's situation would you would our desire be 
for relief, a change in our situation, to eliminate the poils or to heal our bodies. What Job really de desired was a restoration of the relationship that he thought that he had lost with the Eternal. Now, the uh, comment in verse 4 is a very strong comment. It emphasizes the deep and intimate relationship that we he thought was lost between him and the Eternal. Now, let's go back to uh, Zophar's comments, because you would be very surprised what you find there, indeed. So, uh, let's go to Zophar. Chapter 11, verse 5 and 6, even though the Zophar evidently understood the relationship, or at least had an idea of the relationship that Job had with the Eternal, he presumed and evidently desired that the Eternal would speak against Job. You see, Zophar didn't want just the Eternal to encourage him, or just to speak to him, but he wanted the Eternal to speak against him, actually. But most striking is the last part of verse 6. Because this explains that the frame of mind that Zophar approached Job with. Verse 6. Know therefore that God exacts from you less than your iniquity deserves. Another translation of this verse puts it this way. Know this, that God has forgiven some of your sins. So, verse 6 we read, Know therefore that God exacts from you less than your iniquity deserves. <laughs> Imagine, brethren, this explains the frame of mind with Zophar's approach, how Zophar approached Job. Incredible. Again, our focus is on Zophar's perspective. What is his view of God as he is speaking to Job? What does it say about the Zophar's mindset and his view of God when he sees a God that would punish someone this harshly for being self-righteous even when God had forgiven some of Job's sins? Because another translation, verse 6, puts this way, Know it is that God has forgiven some of your sin. So from Zophar's perspective, brethren, Job is being punished this harshly even after God has eliminated some of Job's sins. He has forgotten them. What does this? What does that say about Zophar's mindset, his view of God, and about the interaction he's having with Job? Now it's interesting that Job even struggles with what he considers at times the eternal's harshness. You know, he struggles to understand what he has done to deserve this harsh and hard treatment from the God who he thought was his close, intimate friend who would come into his tent and they would have these conversations. This time of harshness, this theme actually of harshness, is somewhat consistent throughout these chapters 4 through chapter 37. Brethren, a key to understanding the book of Job is to understand the overall structure of the book. You see, as we consider the structure, it is important to recognize that the middle section is more about how an immature or the carnal mind attempts to understand Elohim's ways. It is more about that than how God worked and how he works with humankind and how God is specifically working with Job. That is the reason you see this long discourse of men talking about who and what God is, you know. You see men talking about God, not God interacting with the men. <laughs> it is informing to us to consider the Eternal's response when he decides to intervene in the discussion in Job chapter 38, verse 2. Job 38, 2. Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? 
Brethren Job and his friends were in a place where they did not understand what God was doing. This is a process of reconciliation. It was a process that the Eternal wanted Job to go through to understand. Not that he was doing something specifically wrong, but he wanted Job to come to a new view of what Job was. And Job and his friends did not understand that. They did not have a clear picture of what the Eternal was trying to do. But they did a lot of talking about it anyway. That's what you see in this middle section 4 through chapter 4 through 37. Now what can make it more confusing for all of us is that while many of the things that these men said about God could be true, being applied in the right context. But in this section of Job, they're being misapplied to the eternal and because they didn't understand what the eternal was trying to do in Job's life, it was all misapplied to the eternal. To understand the real purpose of the book, to understand the fundamental theme of the book which we, as called out once, need to understand, we have to understand what the eternal was doing with Job and we have to understand how the eternal constructs this book so that we can look at it correctly. One of the ways we do that to understand how the eternal was working with Job, we have to take the first three chapters together and then connect them to chapters 38, 39, 40, 41 and 42. And when we read those chapters, perhaps it could be something you could do this in this coming week. And when we read these chapters, we see God working with a man to reconcile his mind to himself. So now we have come to the third section of the book of Job, but uh, we will leave that for the next Sabbath because this complex book, really, I'm not going to try to rush for all of us to go through it, but I want us to understand it. So next Sabbath, we'll be talking about the third section. Thank you.